to the next panel, which is uh, Turkish and Sunni Islamic Perspectives, ably led by Dr. Scott Davis, who is one of our fellows this year and last year. And uh, thank you very much for doing this. And I, I, I just want to add that, uh, that Scott probably could have given a, a paper on any one of these perspectives. It's, uh, I know I'm embarrassing him, but he's, uh, he's, he, was he was great to have this year, and thank you. We could not have done it the way we did without you. So go ahead. Okay. All yours. Thanks, Ed, and uh, thanks to everybody for coming. John Kelsey, on my immediate left, is Distinguished Research Professor and Chair of the Department of Religion at Florida State University. He is the author of numerous articles, books, most notably Arguing the Just War in Islam, which came out from Harvard in 2007. He has edited the Journal of Religious Ethics and is now a general editor of the journal Soundings. Lieutenant Colonel Ilkan Kar is currently working at the U.S. War College in Carlisle. He graduated the Turkish Mission, uh, Military Academy in 1997. He's also a commander and instructor in the commando group and a land planning officer for the Turkish general staff. Professor Kirst Kelsey will go first, followed by Lieutenant Colonel. Thanks, Scott, and uh, it's nice to be here again at the Naval Academy. And one of the reasons I'm standing to give my presentation is that beautiful view there. So um, we've agreed uh, to go for about 20 minutes apiece, or, or as my colleague said, maybe even a little shorter, uh, seeing as how we're the last thing between you and the reception. We thought there was a point of virtue in that. Maybe perhaps also a point of survival, I don't know. So you don't want to get between people and their refreshments. So I thought I would start uh, with a story from the biography of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, according to the traditions we have, uh, Muhammad began to proclaim the Quran loudly, began, in other words, to call people to faith in or around the year 6, 612. Uh, he gathered a small community around himself, uh, but it seems there was a great deal of resistance from most of the citizens of Mecca. Among the Quraysh, the leading spokespersons thought of Muhammad as uh, drawing people away from ancestral traditions that had value, undercutting the tribal ways of the Arabs, and they resisted the message. Indeed, uh, according to some accounts, Muhammad and his followers were subjected to a variety of uh, acts that could be counted as discrimination, persecution, some physical punishments, plots against the prophet's life. And at a certain point, we're told that some of the followers of Muhammad came to him and said, authorize us to fight. We know how. Let us defend ourselves, and you will see this harassment will stop. In that context, so the story goes, Muhammad told his followers that the answer was no. He would not give that authorization to fight. I have not been given an order to fight, he said. I've been given an order to preach. Now, a few years after this incident, as the chronology proceeds, things get worse. Muhammad believes that he and his followers are being led to migrate to Medina in the north. And in connection with that move, some sources suggest a little before, some sources suggest a little after, we're told that he is given an order to fight. And the verse 
of the Quran, which is in chapter 22, verses 39 and following, is revealed. Permission to fight is given to those who have been wronged, who have been driven from their homes for no other reason than that they said, we worship God. And the text goes on to say, if God had not deterred some by means of others, then churches and synagogues and mosques where God's name is often mentioned would cease to exist. The point is, in other words, God works God's purpose out however God wishes. Sometimes that includes war. But the point also is that with respect to Muslim ethics about war, it's not so much about fighting or not in this as in other matters. The issue is submission to the will of God. What is God's guidance at a particular place and time? Now, I like to tell that story in part because of the ongoing discussion. Islam, is it a religion of war? Is it a religion of peace? The answer is complicated. It depends. It depends. As in those stories from the prophet, it depends, at least in part, on an assessment of what God's directives are. Now, given this concern that war, as other aspects of life, be brought into a pattern consistent with God's guidance and commands, it's hardly strange that there would have grown up in the centuries following Muhammad's career several different ways in which Muslim intellectuals and others would interact with and try to respond to questions about when war is justified, who authorizes it, how should it be conducted. Philosophers like Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd wrote about this matter, Al-Farabi. Uh, people with experience as court advisors and military uh, commanders wrote about the matter the literature on mirrors for princes, for example, trying to train rulers. I focus myself on the work of a group of scholars uh, whose formal title in Arabic was fuqaha, the people who were experts in fiqh. Now that term requires not only a simple translation but a little bit of an explanation because in the textbooks one reads about Islamic tradition, it's usually translated jurisprudence, and these fuqaha are jurists. There's something to that. They are, after all, trying to ascertain God's commands. There is such a thing uh, as religious law. Uh, people often translate the term sharia that way. And yet, quite literally, the term means, fiqh means, comprehension. The fuqaha are those who are experts in the sources by which one attempts to comprehend the guidance of God. And that guidance has a wider range than what we usually mean by war, by, by law rather. And so when I speak here, as I do today and elsewhere, I'm going to talk about what they do as a practice of Sharia reasoning. Sharia means the path that leads to paradise or to refreshment. Uh, it signals that there's a right way to live. All ways to live are not equal. There's a way, as the great Al Shafi put it, scholar, a member of the class of Fuqaha, who worked in the late 8th and early 9th century, there is a way that leads to felicity in this world and the next. And that way is the Sharia. And the Fuqaha, these scholars, were experts in the practice of Sharia reasoning. They knew the sources, the Quran, 
and the example of the prophet. Their expertise was recognized by other members of the community who came to them for guidance. What's the right thing for a Muslim to do in situation X, Y, or Z? And they responded, knowing that as they read the conditions in front of them, the cases they're addressing, looked to the past to establish precedence in the Quran and the example of the prophet for guidance and tried to find a match. Sometimes the match was fairly clear, sometimes it required reasoning of various kinds, interpretation, analogy, and so on. Even as they did that, they also had their eyes on the future because they knew that it was possible that their responses and judgments would have import by setting precedents for subsequent generations. On all sorts of matters, including matters of war, the Fukaha participated in a kind of transgenerational conversation that is ongoing even to the present day. When people refer back to the Quran, the Sunnah, and judgments by scholars in a variety of settings as ways of trying to find guidance in the here and now. Now, as I say, these scholars rendered judgments with an eye toward textual precedent, current conditions, and future import by way of setting precedent. They also, in their time, were participating in extended conversations, a kind of consultation with political rulers, the people who, in the end, the Fukaha thought had the right to authorize Muslims to fight or not. And they were interacting, it's pretty clear in the text, with military commanders and soldiers in the field. So a host of situations are taken up in these books, and scholars rendered an enormous number of opinions or responsa to questions uh, under the title, The Judgments Pertaining to Jihad, here in the sense of armed struggle. They rendered an enormous number of judgments, as I say, and dealt with a wide variety of cases. And yet they attained a fair degree of consensus on certain basic matters, and these constitute, uh, as I have tried to argue in various publications, a kind of Muslim just war tradition. The consensual matters have to do with, for example, the notion that war is not a private act. It's to be authorized by publicly constituted authorities. The political leader, his advisors, or taking advice from the Fukaha, from political and military advisors, the political leader makes a judgment, or his designee. Uh, in the period of the High Caliphate, for example, we have the stories of Harun al-Rashid uh, calling into for consultation recognized members of the learned class discussing policies with his military commanders and his political advisors and rendering judgments. There's a consultation that goes on. Later in the period of the Abbasid Caliphate, as it became harder to hold authority from a centralized location across a vast expanse, a caliph might designate one or more territorial governors as his designated military person having the right to authorize the use of force. Throughout, though, the point is war is a public act. It's not something to be authorized or started by a single individual or a group. War is just also in connection with certain causes. Not every cause. One doesn't go to war uh, just for the enrichment of the treasury of the caliph, at least one is not supposed to. Uh, one doesn't go to war just because the caliph seeks to um, make himself famous, to have glory through subsequent generations. One goes to war for politically 
recognizable causes, things that have to do with the establishment, the maintain, maintenance, and the defense of a state that is considered legitimate because it has an Islamic religious establishment, the ruler is a Muslim, uh, the ruler consults with members of the religious class, the fuqaha, in an effort to bring state policy into a pattern of consistency with God's guidance. Not everyone in this polity has to be a Muslim. There's a place for the people of protection, Christians, Jews, and others. Uh, I can talk some about more about the details of those arrangements during the question and answer period if people wish. But my point is that just cause is a measure of justice in war with respect to Islam, and these causes, establishing, maintaining, and defending uh, a legitimate geopolitical unit, seem to me to be uh, a way of ruling out some other kinds of causes and trying to channel or regulate armed force so that it serves legitimate political purposes. Finally, war is just when it is conducted rightly, and there are, in effect, a series of objective measures of right intention or right purpose about which the Fukuha agreed. Facing a potential enemy, one gives an invitation first to terms of peace. If that fails, then war results, but it must be conducted according to norms of honorable combat. So, proportionality, for example, in terms of the kinds of weapons that may be utilized, the tactics that may be utilized. In particular, one wants to regulate the conduct of Muslim forces so that there's a good faith attempt to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, between military and civilian targets. And one of the interesting cases, which I'll talk about more in a moment, in which the scholars, the Fukaha, actually disagree, has to do with that kind of attack or that kind of tactic in which one is aiming at a military target but knows that some civilians are going to be killed. There's a test of proportionality. How far can you go in this regard? So right authority, just cause, right intention, uh, measured are as according to the evidence of right conduct, according to a code of honor. These are the things on which the Fukaha agreed, and they constitute the basics of a Muslim just war convention. Now that said, there are some matters on which they disagreed. Uh, there's a whole literature called Iqtilaf. Uh, the great Al-Tabari wrote a book uh, on the disagreements, or Iqtilaf, between the Fuqaha on questions of jihad. And that's how the text proceeds. They agreed about, and he cites opinions. They disagreed about, and then he cites opinions. Where they disagreed, for example, on this question of proportionality in terms of the uh, allowable extent of collateral damage. A scholar like al Shebani, working in the early Iraqi, what became the Hanafi school, an advisor at the court of Harun al-Rashid, is, a, on my reading, a kind of hard-nosed realist about these matters. Faced with the question of what you do in a situation of siege warfare, for example, and using hurling machines, uh, where you know that the projectile that you hurl into the city, uh, you really have no way of knowing that you're going to hit the military barracks or something like that. Uh, but he says, you go ahead and use it anyway uh, until the people surrender. And when asked, about it by his interlocutor in the text. He says, if we stopped fighting for the kinds of reasons you're citing here, if the Muslim forces did, uh, we'd never be able to 
win any victory or to pursue just causes. Our enemies would quickly learn how to set things up so that we can't proceed, in effect. Someone like al Mawarti, on the other hand, worries more about these matters a couple of centuries later, saying that if you cannot win without too much collateral damage, it's better to withdraw and come back to fight another day. So this is a matter on which there can be disagreement. Then, too, there's some evidence in these texts, these historic texts, that there was a question about combatants not, and non-combatants, not so much the question of, uh, a question about non-combatants and their protection or their immunity from direct attack, but how it is that at, you know at the point where a non-combatant has crossed the line and become a combatant say a, a woman or an underage child or an elderly man. These are typically listed as non-combatants. When do they become combatants? Well, if they pick up a weapon and they enter the lists, of course, that's clear enough. But someone like Ibn Taymiyyah seems to have thought in the 14th century that if you had, he explicitly mentions women, if you had women who were engaged in kind of propaganda activity in support of the Muslim war effort, they might legitimately be considered uh, combatants. They had crossed the line. So there's questions there. Then, too, there are some situations in which fighting becomes necessary and is justified according to the Fukaha, which are really made for disagreement and discussion. There's an interesting notion, and I mention it here because I'm going to bring it up toward the end of the talk. It's very important for what's going on today. There's a notion about when it is that fighting becomes an individual duty. It's a complicated notion. In some sense, the text we have suggests that for male believers of a certain age uh, who are bodily capable and so on, there's always a sense in which fighting is an individual duty in that the ruler can call on them to do their part. But for the majority of situations envisioned by these historic scholars, the fact of the matter is they say that fighting in most of these cases should be considered a collective duty. It is something, so long as there are enough people who carry it out, others don't have to go. But now, what if we envision a kind of emergency situation in which an enemy's forces are massed on the borders of Islam? Of course, the ruler is supposed to have provided for defense of the frontier with regular troops, but suppose they're spread too thin. The enemy forces break through. What happens then? Well, according to the Fukaha, that's a situation in which fighting becomes an individual duty for anyone able to carry it out, fighting in defense of Muslim territory. Of course, these people are going to be hoping to receive authorization and help from central authorities, but they don't have to wait on that. They can fight to defend Islamic territory. In fact, the texts say they must. All right. I'm short on time. That's because, as Scott knows, and as you picked up, I'm a southerner and I'm a slow talker, right? So you gotta, gotta indulge me a little bit. All right. Now, Muslim thinking about war, like just war or any other mode of thinking about war, is impacted by changes in technology, of course. There are weapons developments that were never addressed in the time of the prophet. You have to think about what you're going to do with them. Muslim thinking about war is also reflective of changing political conditions. All the judgments that I've spoken of, consensual and matters of disagreement, rendered by the Fukaha, they were developed in the context of what I think we should call an imperial state, a state with large territorial ambitions, theoretically universal. 
But the last vestiges of the old imperial forms passed when in 1922, the new Turkish Republic declared that it would no longer support economically, provide the major financial support for the Ottoman Sultanate. This was the last vestige. These imperial forms had been in retreat due to the progress of European power from the middle of the 18th through the 19th centuries. With the change in the Turkish polity and the demise of the Ottoman Sultanate, the last vestige of those old forms passed. And the question very quickly became, across the Muslim world, what sort of political order should we be seeking? And within that, what would be the role of military force? Now, the vast majority of Muslim polities since that time have taken the form of states with governments participating in the international order of states. And Muslim activity at the UN is uh, evidence of that. Uh, as is writing about jihad. Uh, Muhammad Hamadullah, a great scholar from South Asia, wrote an enormously long work called Muslim Conduct of State. It went into something like nine editions before he died. And it is a work arguing for the consonance between Islamic law and international law. I could cite others in the question and answer. So that's one way to go, integrated into a world of states. But of course, there are others who aren't comfortable with that, who see the formation of states, and particularly of states with parliamentary forms and democratic procedures and constitutions and so on, as something that is more due to Western influence than to Islam. Now, I'm going to go quickly here. Al-Qaeda is not the first group, or even at present, not the only, and I dare say it will not be the last group, to have this kind of sensibility which lends itself to the notion that an, an Islamic state needs to be governed, strictly speaking, by Sharia precedents, laws clearly devi uh, derived from the Quran and the example of the Prophet, and which believes that armed struggle as resistance to injustice is called for in the here and now. When Al-Qaeda and assorted other groups, when bin Laden, Zawahiri, and others joined in the promulgation of the 1998 World Islamic Front Declaration on Armed Struggle Against Jews and Crusaders, they cast their call of fighting in terms of the individual duty. And what they said in one of the most quoted lines of that text is that the current conditions, looking back, interpreted in the light of established precedent, mean that it's the duty of every Muslim to fight against Americans and their allies, civilians and soldiers, in any country where that is possible. Now this is the subject, of course, of extended debate. Let me close this way, because I can go through the criticisms of uh, bin Laden and others in the Q&A period. But let me close this way. One of the features of the conflict in Syria currently, just to take one case, which of course has a much longer background than is usually told in journalistic stories, uh, not only the repression of the Assad regime and of his father's regime, but a, a long drought that affected the economy and made people move to cities and lacking ba basic services. There's a lot to tell about that. But one of the features as that conflict has continued that has come to the fore is the multiplication of involvement by groups who appeal to the individual duty as justification for fighting. You don't have to wait for a command from an established authority. 
if you see the need, you come to the aid of those who are under attack. Appeals to individual duty, it's a legitimate concept in the historic tradition. But I would say that the multiplication of that kind of appeal by a variety of groups in the here and now is a sign of a kind of crisis of legitimation, political legitimation, in the historically Muslim regions. The, way, the reason I say that is basically these groups are arguing we have the right to take up arms and defend the cause of justice because no one else is doing it. We see the need. We can respond. Of course, it's true. As the governments of various states in the region see, uh, as I hope our own leaders in the United States and our allies see, that that kind of appeal has anarchic implications. It's a serious matter, especially in a region that is awash in arms, and when young men can be drawn in through what we might call the romance of resistance fighting. This is an important factor in thinking about responses. I'll look forward to your questions. Lieutenant uh, Colonel Lukyarjan from Turkish Army. Uh, it's nice to be here. And uh, I have a presentation, and I want it to make shorter because I know I am the last man <laughs> who make the presentation. And I see a lot of professors and uh, senior officers, and uh, I haven't got enough experience like them, but uh, I try to explain uh, Turkish perspective. And uh, I want to give uh, some examples uh, about uh, Atatürk, who founder of the founder of uh, Turkish Republic. Uh, I think he, he was the best example uh, of our uh, military tradition and uh, military culture. And uh, the content of uh, my uh, presentation is uh, the history of Turkish military judicial system, uh, Turkish military justice, a short brief of uh, Turkish military system, and because it is different from the United States uh, military system, uh, the, law of, the law of war and the law of uh, armed conflicts, uh, education in military academies, uh, laws that regulate the conduct of war, going to war, uh, just at Berlin. Uh, before uh, starting uh, to my presentation, I want to give an example about the tradition of the Turkish mil uh, military. After winning the independence uh, war against the Greek army, uh, as a uh, celebration, uh, when uh, they enter to the city of Izmir, they lay the uh, Greek flag for the Atatürk to step on it. But uh, Atatürk refused to step on the Greek fleet, the flag. And uh, he said that the flags are the proud of the nations and uh, they shall not be stepped on, even they are the flag of our enemies. I think uh, it is one example uh, of our tradition for the respect to your enemy. Uh, our uh, military uh, warfare and ed ethics are historically uh, tradition of uh, Turkish tradition and before uh, Islam, the source, war, uh, the source of uh, our military system is uh, the Turkish culture. And uh, as a tradition, it is forbidden uh, for the soldiers and for the warriors uh, to use force against women, children, very old people, non-combatants, and who have surrendered. And it is not with the Islam, and it was as uh, two or three, uh, two thousand years ago. Become it's a very old uh, tradition, and these traditions uh, make our army strong, and uh, Ottoman army rule uh, the hot points of uh, the current world. The, Balkans, Caucasus, and the uh, Middle East with peace in a very long time, for hundreds of years. The, uh, I think uh, I have to mention the judicial system, or the military judicial system, uh, because 
if you have a military judicial system, uh, it means that your uh, army has a accountability, and your military actions also has uh, accountability. And uh, the birth of of our military judicial uh, in Turkey encounters the foundation of the Ottoman Empire. Orhan Gazi, uh, the second Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, was founder of the Janissaries. The Janissary is the meaning of the new soldier. And uh, with the Janissaries, uh, concurrent the military judicial system was established, uh, including a warfare ethics known as uh, Kanunayme Yenişeri. The meaning is uh, the law of new soldiers. Uh, in uh, 1826, uh, Ottoman Empire abolished, abolished the uh, Yenicheris. And uh, Turkish government need uh, modernization in the army. The best example at that time uh, was the French army, the Napoleonic army. And uh, in uh, 1869, the French military penal code uh, translated and adapted as a Askeri Ceza Kanunnameyi Humayun. The meaning is uh, military penal court. And uh, in the period of uh, Abdulhamid II in uh, 1880s, German military criminal court was translated and only the most required uh, 56 paragraphs were added to relevant piece, uh, places in the court. And uh, our military penal code and military uh, judicial system are, was uh, compatible with the European at that time. Okay. And uh, the military penal code we still use is uh, established in uh, 1930s and uh, like the like, uh, as the other countries, penal, uh, military penal codes, uh, with a lot of modi modifications, we use the same penal code still. Military justice, uh, according to Constitution, Article uh, 145, military justice uh, shall be exercised by military courts and military dis disciplinary courts. These courts shall have uh, jurisdiction uh, to try military offenses committed by military personnel and offenses committed by military personnel against military personnel or related to military service and duties. I want to make it shorter, if you don't uh, mind. Uh, according, uh, I, and I want to give a short brief of uh, our military system. Uh, according uh, to Article uh, 17 of the Constitution, uh, the fatherland service is right to and the duty of the every Turk. And how does this service is uh, in the armed forces or public sector is carried out and is supposed to be uh, carried out is sub subscribed by the law. Sorry because of my pronunciation. And. Uh, in the United States, uh, the army is consists of uh, volunteer citizens, but uh, in our country, army is uh, consists of uh, all the male population. All of the male population uh, must serve in the army. All the men uh, between the age of 19 and 40 are liable for uh, military service men who have uh, not fulfilled their military service by the age of 40 and who have uh, not been legally attempted from service may still be called uh, up after the age of uh, 40. Uh, the length of uh, military service is uh, 15 months. University graduates, uh, university graduates uh, may perform uh, six months military service or uh, 12 months uh, if they are trained to become uh, reserve officers. Certain professional groups, doctors, teachers, civil servants, may be permitted to perform special services. Uh, for example, the teachers may do their uh, job in the different part of the country.
Turkish Armut uh, Forces give uh, law of war and law of uh, armed conflict education both in uh, colleges and military academies. Uh, as an example, uh, I take the military academy uh, law education instead of naval academy or uh, Air Force Academy. academy. Uh, I am an infantry officer, so I take from the military academy. Uh, in the first uh, two years, uh, the military uh, the education of law is uh, the same for all the cadets. Uh, but uh, after two years, uh, last two years of the uh, military academy, uh, the cadets take different uh, law education, law education uh, according to their uh, bachelor degree, which they cho uh, choose. And I put the third and fourth year uh, for the public administration program. During the service, uh, during an officer's career, based on the assigned service or duty, uh, they take uh, different kinds of courses about the uh, law and ethics. If you want to uh, send your officers to abroad in other country or different missions, uh, you have to give some uh, military ethics or military law uh, education again. And we have some courses about this, and we give this, I put three examples. And uh, according to our constitution, uh, one of the duties of the powers of the Grand National Assembly of the Turkey, uh, it is the civilian aut authority, has the right, uh, the declaration of the state of war and authorization to deploy the armed forces. The military commanders or the military leaders hasn't got this right. They can't use force against another country or another unit. Uh, in, the, our, in our constitution, Article 92, the power uh, to authorize the declaration of the state of war uh, in, in the cases uh, deemed uh, the power to authorize the declaration of the state of war in the cases deemed legitimate by the international law and the except where required by uh, international treaties to which Turkey is uh, a party or by the rules of the international courts, uh, courts to send the Turkish armed force to uh, foreign countries and to allow foreign armed forces to be stationed in Turkey is vested in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. It is also the civilian uh, power, civilian authority. If the country is subjected to sudden uh, armed aggression uh, while the Grand Assembly of Turkey is adjourned in a recess and it uh, thus becomes imperative to decide immediately on the use of the armed forces, the President of the Republic can decide on the use of the Turkish armed force. It is also a civilian authority, not a military authority. And uh, I want to give an example uh, about uh, our uh, tradition and uh, uh, relation with the Sunni Islam. Uh, when the uh, Turkish Republic is founded, uh, the Turkish Republic was an Islamic state. And uh, do you know how we became a secular state? I think nobody knows. We erased only one sentence in the Constitution in 1928. And this sentence uh, said that uh, the religion of the Turkish Republic is Islam. And we erased this sentence, only one sentence. And the Islamic State, some country, became a secular country. Uh, our uh, constitution, uh, the Islamic constitution also, is not uh, different from the international rules. All the international rules are compatible with our constitution. And one more difference uh, bet uh, between the international law and uh, the domestic law. Most of the countries, the domestic law is more important than the international law, and superior than the, if there's a conflict, the uh, domestic law is superior than the international law. But in our country, country in our constitution, uh, Article 9, 90, international agreements uh, duly put into effect uh, have the force of 
law, no appeal to constitutional court shall be made with regard to these agreements on the grounds that they are uh, un unconstitutional. In the case of conflict between international agreements duly put into effect concerning the fundamental rights and freedoms and laws to, due to difference in the provisions on the same matter, the provisions of the international agreements shall prevail. Uh, the international law is a higher level in our constitution than the domestic laws because they, they have to be compatible. And uh, for our tradition, and uh, I want to give an example. Uh, tomorrow is the 25th of April and it is the day of the Anzacs. And uh, we fight Anzacs in the First World War for a long period, in, especially in Dardanelles. After the, after the one year in the Dardanelle War, uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Turkish Republic, uh, made an addressing. And uh, according to this addressing, those uh, heroes that uh, shed their blood on, and lost their lives, you are now uh, lying in the soil of the friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmeds to us where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mother who sent their uh, sons from far away countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosoms and are in peace. After having lost their lives, they have become our sons as well. Kemal Atatürk. And according to Kemal Atatürk, what he thinks about the war, I think uh, it is very important. A war uh, should only be fought against, uh, against the ones who claim we kill you by saying to them we will not die. Unless the nation uh, is in cruel danger, the war is a murder. I think uh, it best explains what uh, the Turkish Republic think uh, about the uh, war and the uh, warfare. Thanks. This, this is for uh, Professor Kelsey. Thank you, uh, both of you. Um, so the, the idea of, uh, um, of the, the individual duty to stand against injustice, um, that, that's really a powerful mobilizing frame, it seems. And, and I guess Al-Qaeda has used it to great advantage. And, and right now, I'm, for, my, for my dissertation, I'm looking into social movement theory and, and what they say about these sort of things. And, and one of the key, what a lot of social movement theorists are saying is that the, the key to uh, whether or not a, a frame like that resonates or doesn't resonate is the, who is the opposition to that frame. So who is, who is out there saying, no, that's wrong, and here's why you're or offering a counter to that frame. And is, is, so who is doing that? Who is arguing against that idea of uh, individual duty being, uh, you know, the responsibility to. You mean in terms of the intra-Muslim Right, intra, debate. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of people. <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it, one, given the historical background that I uh, summarized so quickly, uh, well, you might not have felt it was so quickly, but I went through a lot of a lot of centuries there <laughs> in a short time. Um, given that background, one of the immediate objections you would expect to the uh, World Islamic Front Declaration and to this notion of individual duty is to say, well, who authorized you to make this claim? Not only as a matter of the public authority aspect of war itself. But the fact is that the signatories of this text, none of them were actually recognized members of the learned class. So the authority thing works on a couple of fronts in that regard. And 
bin Laden and the others, their answers uh, in a variety of settings uh, appealed to the notion that the established authorities either can't or won't do the things that are necessary to push back. I mean, part of the narrative in which this is embedded, of course, is that the Ummah, the community of Islam, is under attack. And the very things that make up the international system of states, uh, insofar as those are tied to democratic practice and that sort of thing, particular economic regimes, the idea is that those are anti-Islam. That's part of the narrative. Here we have this enemy. Uh, the text of the World Islamic Front Declaration says at a certain point, there's never been a time like this before when the nations of the world are attacking Muslims as though they were attacking a plate of food. You know, So the idea is there's an emergency condition the individual duty, that's their answer to that kind of criticism. But now there are a variety of other criticisms which have to do with what exactly the historical um, uh, notion of individual duty uh, in terms of a case of defense, what it justifies, what it lets you do. So someone like Yusuf al Karadawe, who's a very prominent um, scholar with a, a television following, big website. He's al-Azhar educated. Uh, he's associated in some way with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, he, he has tried to argue, in effect, that yes, there is a thing, uh, fighting as an individual duty, but it really is only in the uh, immediate case of defense. So Iraq, for him, was a case where you could talk about individual duty. Um, uh, the encounter between uh, Israelis and Palestinians, that's a case where he talks about individual duty. He hasn't quite used the term individual duty for Syria, though some of his rhetoric gets close. He'll say things like, we need people to go to the aid of these suffering people. And he criticizes the governments of Egypt and other states, why don't they at least, if they're not going to send help, why don't they allow young people to go to fight? They should be helping them to get there and join in the cause. But his, his point is the device, uh, you might say, has to do with something like this. Defense is allowed as an individual duty, but not calculated reprisal. You know. Uh, you're, another way to put it, there's a distinction between the near enemy and the far enemy. So you, you can fight against the near enemy, it's in your land, but you're not supposed to strike at the far enemy. So Karadawi condemned the 9-11 attacks, the bo London bombings, and so on. His point is, is not to challenge that there could be a legitimate role uh, for a group to claim individual duty in the case of defense, but to indicate that it really has restrictions tied all around it. And it's kind of obvious why it would. You don't want a band of individuals to undertake actions that have import for the whole community. That was another response to the Al-Qaeda uh, notion and the attacks on 9-11 and in European lands. Look what you brought back on us in terms of American allied forces. Yeah. So there are people, yes, a lot of people arguing about this thing. I can add something about this article. According to uh, our Islamic beliefs, uh, the jihad is the duty of the government and uh, has a serious, uh, how can we say, and it is not easy to declare uh, a jihad in other countries. It's very hard because there are a lot of things you have to establish. Uh, and the, in, the individuals are not permitted uh, to declare war. It is not their duty uh, for declared jihad. They haven't got any permission for this. And uh, for a long time uh, in the Islamic countries, uh, jihad is not used. But uh, for some groups, some uh, groups who claim that they are Muslims or Islam, uh, Al-Qaeda or Wahhabi or the Salafi uh, beliefs. Uh, I think 
there is some misinterpretation of Islam or old things, and uh, also uh, there is a misleading uh, figure in the history. I think uh, Ibn Taymiyyah will give the permission. And, uh, He's not the only historical writer who who did it, though. Okay, it is the most the most known. That's that's true. And this, he's the one that is cited in a lot of the Al Qaeda literature. And so, on. yeah. But uh, according to real Islam, it's not true, which the Al Qaeda or the Wahhabis or the Salafis do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, I want to give an example: uh, the Wahhabis or the Al Qaeda groups when they uh, occupied a place in, we have examples in Syria or the uh, other part of the world, they destroyed the graveyards. And it was n never made by the Muslims in the history, even the time of the uh, Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never exercised this. They never destroy any graveyard, or they destroy the historical monuments. And it's not related with the uh, Islamic beliefs or Islamic traditions. They are newly established, not more than I think one or two hundred years ago. Uh, not related, in my opinion, not related with uh, our religion. Well, thank you both. Uh, uh, this question is uh, for Colonel John. Uh, for decades, the Turkish military have been uh, were great upholders of the secular state, and we know from uh, you know, just from the newspapers that in the last ten years there was some conflict between the governing party and uh, the military. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment about what the stance of the officer corps is toward the role of religion in the state now. Uh, I think I mentioned how we became uh, a secular country. We changed only one sentence in our <laughs> constitution. And uh, the person who made military service uh, comes through the, our nation. And if our nation is religious, our military is also became a religious uh, military. But uh, there isn't any conflict with the civilians uh, and uh, with the military. But in the history, uh, there is some uh, military corps. Uh, I don't uh, think that this is uh, because of the conflict with the civilians or the military. Uh, it is uh, related with the uh, power struggle and uh, not depend on the religion. Thanks to both of you. This is really way too big a question for two minutes to four, but uh, still to, to think about. And of course, this is something you've written much and excellently on, John. But when you compare, and this is a seminar on comparative ethics, with Western, what we can broadly call Western tradition, it after a while, it comes together. It, it creates a sort of conglomerate that we today know as just war theory. Happens gradually, but one could say to a large extent in the 1600s with Hugo Grotius, for instance, or John Locke. Why does not that really happen within Islam broadly or, or Sunni Islam. When you look at the amazing work of the jurists back in the 800s, like al Shabani, you have all the elements of what one would believe would become a just war theory. Now, you could, of course, answer, well, that is there. But uh, most of us would say that it's more clearly defined in the West than it is in, in uh, Islam. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I guess I, my first response is, it is there, <laughs> and I do think it's, it's fairly clearly uh, defined. But now, in the nature of the case, the way that the, um, the system works of Sharia reasoning, uh, jurists study standard works within um, the trad tradition or trajectory of interpretation of a certain school of thought and they participate in that by developing it, at least if they attain a certain kind of scholarly rep reputa reputation, they can make uh, render judgments. Uh, in the nature of the case, you're always responding to specific and pretty concrete questions. 
Um, and so while it's clear enough, I think, that in the course of uh, centuries in the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, just to take an extended period of time, that this consensus about right authority, just cause, and right intention with the evidence of right conduct, I think that's pretty clear. But it, 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 you, you don't usually find someone who renders a little succinct statement, like say Thomas Aquinas did in the article. Uh, it, but it, it's clearly what's being, what's there. Um, so I, I guess I'd say it did come together, and it still exercises weight. That's one of the reasons why there is, and there has been, and there will continue to be so much. Um, criticism in response to the claims and tactics of groups like Al Qaeda is that at the very least you'd have to say they are taking a strand of the tradition and and stretching it and the idea is if you pull that strand too far do you undo the network of things that have been built up over time for codes of honor for example as uh, my colleague here spoke about in terms of uh, military ethics in the Turkish case. So. Well, that brings us to the end of the hour. I'm sure that our panelists would be delighted to continue these conversations at the reception shortly to be had. And join with me in thanking them. <laughs>